worship the holy God. That's why we're here this morning, to worship the holy God. Thank you for joining us. You may be seated. It's a lovely day. Amen. So thankful the lakes are here and uh, look forward to eating cookies with you after the service at the reception. So thankful for our Kids Zone volunteers uh, systematically and faithfully teaching our kids the Word of God week in and week out. We're in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. If you'd like to open your Bibles with me, um, Nehemiah chapter 8. And this morning we're talking about the real problem, uh, the problem underneath the problem. Uh, do you realize that sometimes the things that we think are the problem are only symptoms of the problem, and sometimes there's a problem underneath, underneath the problem. And so, you know, for example, maybe you just wish if I just made a little bit more money, you know, every paycheck, I'd have a little bit more money at the end of the month. You know, if I just made a little bit more. And then you get the raise you've been hoping for, and what happens? Yeah, you still need a little bit more money. Like, it turns out that that didn't quite do it after a little bit. And you're like, maybe there's a problem underneath the problem, and maybe it's how I handle money or something along those lines. Other times, maybe you're fighting with your spouse and you realize, man, I am overreacting to this. What's going on? And as you analyze it, you think, probably my spouse is not that big a problem. Probably it's me reacting to my family of origin and I'm bringing that baggage with me into this relationship. Sometimes there's a problem underneath the problem. And we're going to talk about how to deal with a problem underneath the the problem today from Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah at, was in Susa, modern day Iran. Um, you can go and see the ruins of Susa today and heard reports of Jerusalem being in a really bad spot and not having a wall. And it had been 140 years since the wall had been broken down and they were suffering and it was shameful. It's like a body without an immune system. Um, a city without a wall. And so he goes himself and gives his life for a little while to rebuilding this wall. And so here's a picture of uh, an artist's rendition of what the wall would have looked like around the city that he gave his life to and um, recruited people and helped you know, organize the people as they rebuilt the wall. And of course, that got finished in Nehemiah chapter 6. And so I was kind of expecting the book to end there. But of course the book keeps going, and here we are in Nehemiah chapter 8, and the book hasn't ended, and I thought the problem was solved. But see, that's because there's a problem underneath the problem. The wall wasn't the real problem. The wall was a symptom of the problem, and now Nehemiah is going to address the problem underneath the problem, the real problem are people's hearts. So what, what we're talking about then is God-powered resilience for first for rebuilding. That was the first six chapters where Nehemiah is organizing the rebuilding of the wall and now for recommitment as he steers the people's hearts back towards God. So before we read, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would meet us in this text. Pull us back towards yourself. Stand in front of me while I'm in front of them. Talk over me while I talk to them. Do this for your glory and our good and the sake of the world that you love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square. The, the wall is done, and now people are gathering as one man into the square. And so they gather before the water gate. And so you can see the water gate over here. Um, later on, when we're talking about the Feast of Booths, 
or tabernacles will be over here at the gate of Ephraim. That'll come near the end of the chapter, but I'll just show you the picture now. Water gate on one side, temple complex up here, um, gate of Ephraim up there. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Ezra, bring the book, read to us. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could, what's that next word? Understand, that's going to be a really important word this morning. You'll see that again a couple times. And all who could understand what they heard the first day of the seventh month. And he read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could, what's that next word? Understand, it's an important word today. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right, and Padiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hashbanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And so these, you know, bunch of them are on the right, bunch of them are on the left. Actually, you're facing me, so it would be right and left. I did my right anyway. You get, you get what I'm saying? It's perspective, right? And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, and he was above all the people. So they could all see he had his book open, and he wasn't making this stuff up. He was reading it from the book. And he opened it, and all the people, what's that next word? Stood. Now, we're going to have you stand later. We're not going to have you stand now. But, so I'm just fair warning, because you're going to be like, I don't want to stand. Okay, well, I'll stand later, but it, this comes from the Bible. Am I making this stuff up? No. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and I just want you to see right now it's coming from the Bible. And all the people, and he, as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. That's what Cheyenne was talking about when, during the worship service. And all the people answered. Notice how responsive this is. So uh, all the people stand, and then he blesses it, and the people react uh, out loud with their words, and they say, amen, amen, lifting up their hands. And so they're saying, amen, amen, verily, verily, truly, truly, and they're lifting up their hands. They're standing and they're lifting up their hands. You're not going to like this. You're going to be like, sup, bro, are we changing denominations or something? <laughs> because we're going to lift up our hands later on. And they bowed their heads, okay? So, you know, they like, they, they feel the weight of it, and they bow their heads, and they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they're worshiping the Lord with their bowed heads and their faces on the ground. I won't make you do that today. <laughs> so you can be thankful for that. But what I want you to see is, like, this is, their bodies are engaged. Have you ever seen Jewish people worship at the Wailing Wall? You know how they're like going back and forth like this when they pray? That's because they believe that physicality matters. Like God made all of us, not just part of us. And so being physically engaged in the act of worship helps you actually worship. And they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akuv. Uh, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Keltia, Ezariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleah, and the Levites helped the people to, what's that next word? Understand. Understand. That's really important. The law and the people remained in their places. So it's kind of like Ezra and his boys are up on the platform and he, they're taking turns reading probably. And then then the breaks between readers, maybe the Levites are scattering among the peoples, helping them understand what's been read, like answering questions or helping people uh, understand that last paragraph or what just happened there in the scriptures. And they read from the book and the law 
clearly, or I like the footnotes there, with interpretation or paragraph by paragraph. Like, there's just one kind of plotters, one verse at a time, you know, one, one thought, one passage at a time. And they gave the sense so that the people, what's that next word? Understood, Understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this, is a whole, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. So the idea of holy is to be set apart to God, like um, only God's. Like this is God's day. This is a day for God. So he's saying, do not mourn or weep. Now why would they be mourning and weeping? Yeah, conviction, because they've just heard the word, and they understand the word, and we'll talk about what that means in just a second. But note that theme up there. Also note that holiness doesn't... Okay, so sometimes you mourn and weep and confess, but that's to get through to the other side of joy and happiness and praise. So sometimes that's necessary, but joy and praise is the goal okay so this day is holy to the lord your god do not mourn or weep for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law then he said to them so no more weeping and mourning this day is holy to the lord he says go your way eat the fat like eat the best part of the meal eat, get cook the best dinner you can cook and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing. So share with other people who don't have anything. For this day is holy to our God. And do not be grieved. He says it again. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Wow, that's awesome. We're going to come back to that. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is why you celebrate. You celebrate and you rejoice. And you do not be grieved. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. Man, they feel the weight of their sin. They feel it. And they're saying, Now is not the time. Now is the time for rejoicing. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions to the people who don't have any and to make great rejoicing because they understood the words that were declared to them they understood there's that word again they understood so if there's if we're going to solve the real problem look at the real problem and for nehemiah he was looking at them saying the wall not having a wall is not the real problem first we'll fix the wall but then we're going to deal with the real problem which is our hearts and so to understand the word means, number one, you talk about all the grieving and the mourning and the weeping and the, the repentance, and that's, man, they just came under conviction that God had warned them and that they had ignored this warning. So the, the thing is, God had warned them and warned them and warned them in the law that if you become like the people of the land, then I will take you out of the land. I didn't put you in the land so you'd be just like the people in the land. I put you in the land so you'd be a light to the people in the land. And you'll only be a light to the people in the land if you're different from the people of the land. And by different, I mean morally pure. I mean morally set apart to God. And what the people are realizing is they had been doing all the things that got them sent into the exile for in the first place. And so they're just under this conviction of like, we are on the same path as our fathers. We are getting the same things wrong as our fathers. All the reasons God punished them, we're reacting. We're doing over and over again right now, and God has no reason not to punish us and send us back to Babylon. And so they're weeping, and they're mourning, and they know that they were wrong. And they might have read passages like this. Deuteronomy 28, verse 52. When God is saying, if you're like the people in the land, bad things are going to happen to you. He says, they shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. Like, 
He has warned us. He has warned us. He has warned us. He has warned us. What will we do? Okay. Do you keep sinning even though God has warned you and warned you and warned you? Don't do that. <laughs> Repent. And rejoice that God restores. Okay, so this is what they've been saying is God restores. So today is a day of rejoicing. So with these next couple pictures, I'm going to tell you the story of Genesis 12 through Nehemiah 8. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of a long trip. And uh, anyway, so... Abraham is called out of Ur. So Ur is here where we are in Babylonia, modern day Iraq, the southern part. And um, God says, come and I will bless you and make you a blessing. So God calls him out of Ur into the promised land. And again, when you're doing this, you're talking in broad sweeps. And one thing leads to another and his family ends up in slavery in Egypt. But God calls Moses and leads them out of slavery in Egypt um, into the promised land, up to the promised land, but the people refuse to go in because they're scared, so they spend 40 years wandering in the Sinai desert, in the Sinai wilderness. And so uh, God then leads them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, and they're in the promised land through the book of Judges, through the books of history. They're in the promised land. And, but the problem is they become just like the people in the land. They become too assimilated. They morally compromise. They become idolatrous. They, they are no longer a light to the world. They are part of the darkness. And so God brings in Babylon to utterly crush them and then bring them back out to Ur, or I'm sorry, to Babylon from whence they came. So like we're going to start over. We're going to have a fresh start. Back to Babylon you go. And so now, recent, most recently in their history then, they have returned to the land, and they rebuilt the temple, and now finally, as like a culmination to all of it, they rebuilt the wall. And, and what... What Nehemiah is saying is today is a day of rejoicing because you see God's grace to bring us back, to restore the temple, and to restore the wall. Can you see that God is patient? Can you see that God is kind? Can you see that God is utterly king over all of it, like we sang? And that God is full of grace and mercy. Can you rejoice that he is a God whose heart longs to restore you? Hey, does that meet you anywhere? Like, like, is that, is that? I don't know where you are, but God's heart is to restore you. I don't know what you're going through, but his heart is to restore you and bring you back. So, we rejoice when we read, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is is your strength. And when I'm contemplating this, I really think the joy of the Lord is our strength. Because I think, how is the joy of the Lord our strength? I think the joy of the Lord is our strength because it is energizing to know that God is in charge and that God is good. And for them, it, for them, okay, the joy of the Lord is your strength. God is utterly in charge. God reigns over the hearts of kings and he is very, very good. He is very, very kind. He brings us back. And for us, for us, this is like God is in charge and he is dying on the cross good. He is taking our place, dying for our sins good. He is utterly in charge and he bore your shame. He is utterly in charge, and he was whipped and beaten and crucified and tortured to death for you. So 
So the joy of the Lord is your strength because you think this is who is in charge. This is who reigns. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be grieved because God is in charge. Okay, so now it's time to stand. Go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read this together three times. Okay, but I'm going to read first, and then you're going to read. Okay, so it's going to be like call and response. I'm going to read, then you're going to read. So only read what I read, all right? So let's lift our hands together. We're going to read out loud. I'm, I'm going to read, and then you're going to read. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Have a seat. Amen. Now, it's one thing to read, and, and when we pronounce it, and we shout it, we, we say it, like, oh, the, just, you feel the strength of the Lord kind of infuse you. And, and it's one thing to feel in a moment. It's another thing for that to carry you through the week. It's another thing that, for that to carry you through the month or, or through the year. And this is the real problem sometimes is that we get distracted from this, we lose sight of this, we forget this, and we get caught up in the everydayness of life. So, the Lord prescribes a disruption. The Lord prescribes a disruption. So when you see this, we're finally getting to this now, when you see this, think prescribed disruption. Okay, this is what we're going to learn about in these next couple of verses. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. So before Everyone was there. Everyone was there that could understand. Men, women, everyone that could understand. Now it's heads of households because they're actually going to do Deuteronomy chapter 6 and they're going to teach their children. Came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded Moses. And they're like, oh, we found something we didn't know was here. Whoa, we didn't even realize that was in here. That's always fun when you find something new like that. And the people of Israel should dwell in booths or temporary shelters. And so with a lot of help from Brendan, somebody asked me if I built this. I said, no, I just stood here and held stuff, you know, and, and uh, Brendan built this booth and I think it's pretty awesome. And the people of Israel should dwell in booths or temporary shelters during the feast of the seventh month. Now, how long are they supposed to stay in the booth? Maybe an afternoon? <laughs> I mean, so, so have you ever built a fort? Yeah, I mean, a couple of you. How long did you live in the fort? I mean, not very long, usually. So, and you probably took breaks from the fort, right? Okay, that the people of Israel should dwell in booths and the feast of the seventh month. So after harvest, harvest, it's like seventh month would be late September, early October, um, mid-September, mid-October, that idea. And that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem and go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Okay, so you go out to the fields or the woods or wherever you can find them, you bring in your tenting supplies, and you assemble it. And the people went out and brought them and made booze for themselves. Each Now watch this, watch this list here. Each on his roof. So you have a perfectly good house. Instead of living in the perfectly good house, you go up on the roof, exposed to all the elements, 
and live in your booth, in your tent, and in their courts. So you have a perfectly good house, but instead you're in your yard, living in the booth, because this is a prescribed disruption. In the courts of the houses of God, and in the square at the water gate, in the square at the gate of Ephraim. That's, we saw that on the map earlier in the beginning, if you remember. So there's people scattered in these little booths kind of everywhere on the temple end of the city. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths. From the days of Jeshua, that's an alternate spelling of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. Now, this is um, curious because there are, do seem to be records of people celebrating the Feast of Booths, other places in Scripture. You know, Ezra 3, 4 is one of those. I think, I think the difference is here they actually make the booths and they actually live in the booths the whole time that it is prescribed. So what I'm saying is this would be very disruptive to their lives, like it would be very disruptive to your life if you were told you had to make a fort and live in it for seven days. I spoiled it, but that's what we're going to see. It's for seven full days, and on the eighth day, they still live in it, but then they get to go home. Talk about disruption. And, and it looks like they just hadn't done it up to this point. Like Ezra 3-4, they, they celebrate it, but he says it hadn't done so, so maybe they came and they stayed with other friends, or they, they just kind of had a feast and then went home like one day rather than eight or, or what, but they hadn't all the way to ten disrupted their life until now. And there was very great rejoicing. You see, they put themselves in position to rejoice by disrupting their lives. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law. Looks to me like they went to church eight days in a row and heard from the word eight days in a row. That would be disruptive. But if you want to change your life, you can't keep it the same. You're like, Pastor, that's the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. I'll say it again in case you missed it the first time. If you want to change your life, you can't keep it the same. If you want to change your life, you have to disrupt your life. And so they disrupt their lives. And they live in little huts. And they go to church eight days in a row to hear the word. If you want to change your life, you have to disrupt your life. And a thing to disrupt it for is the word. They disrupt their life for the word and for a community. They kept the feast for seven days, all seven days. Like you can imagine, like if, how much privacy is in something like this? Not a lot of privacy. I mean, if, if you're having a fight with your spouse in something like this, do you think the tent next door could hear you? If your kids are disobeying and you're trying to correct them and you're living in something like this, do you think the tent next door can hear you? If you're frustrated with dinner and how things are going and you're having a discussion about what to have to dinner and how that's going, do you think the tent next door can hear you? Like, this is community. And I find a lot of people are for community. In fact, I think almost everybody is for community until they try it. And, and then they're like, man, that's really hard. I don't know if I like that. I need a break. I need a safe space where I can get away from community. Community is disruptive. It's hard. But if you want to change your life, community is the way to do it. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. So Leviticus 23, which I've cited several times up there, didn't take the time to point out each time. Um, 
kind of is a, a summary of the Feast of Booze, and it points out that on the first day and the eighth day of the feast is a day of solemn rest where you can do, and here's the phrase. Here's the phrase I want you to remember for Sabbath. It says you do no ordinary work. I challenge you. I'm gonna just going just gonna to kind of lay this out for you. I challenge you to have a day where you do no ordinary work. That is so difficult. Like, I started thinking about no ordinary work. Making meals is ordinary work. Doing laundry is ordinary work. Online shopping is ordinary work. Email is ordinary work. Cleaning the house is ordinary work. Have a day where you do no ordinary work. That is disruptive. But here's the thing. A lot of us go through life and we run, 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 and we're exhausted and angry and depressed and have anxiety and we're, we're just so done. And we say, what you need is Sabbath. And we go, I don't have time for that. Well, maybe what you need is Sabbath, and maybe what you need is this prescribed disruption where you do no ordinary work. You come to church, you worship, you hear the word, and you do no ordinary work. You just feast. You practice community. Here's what we've said. We said the problem often isn't the real problem. So for Nehemiah, he didn't think he could stop once he got the wall built. I mean, for me, I'm such a task-oriented person. I, I'm sure I would have gotten the wall built and been like, all right, we'll see you. You guys are all set. I'm going to head back to being a cupbearer for the king. They need me in um, Susa, so I'm going I'm to go ahead and head back. And uh, Nehemiah didn't think that. Like he thought... Getting the wall built is just a first step. It's just a first step. So we said, address the real problem. Address the real problem. And there are very few real problems that can't be addressed by a better understanding of the word. Understand the word. If the real problem is we're getting assimilated to the culture and we're becoming more and more like the people of the land, then the, a really important next step is to understand the word, to become people of the book. And then learn to rejoice in God's salvation. Because I'll tell you, discontentment, dissatisfaction with God leads to all manner of evil and destruction. Fix the real problem by understanding scripture and rejoicing through prescribed disruption. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for meeting us in your word today. And Lord, I pray that we would go out of here determined to rejoice, determined that